Our first reading of the day is from Romans 5, 1 through 5. Peace with God through faith. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access by faith into the into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God lo- God's love has poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to each of us. Our Gospel lesson is from the Gospel of John, John 16, 12 through 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you.
Last week, you will recall the Susquehanna Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church was seated, whereby clergy and lay members listened to reports, approved regular business, and voted on several important issues. Now, these types of, of gatherings for Methodism uh, first began in England in the 1740s, and in 1773, the first American conference was convened at the historic St. George's Chapel in Philadelphia. Uh, I imagine for conferences held in the 18th century, taking attendance was uh, somewhat of an easy procedure. But I suppose somewhere along the way, as these gatherings grew to such an extent that recording exactly who was present at each session became uh, something of a fool's errand. And so fast forward to this year's conference. I'll have you know that both clergy and laity still hold to that time-honored tradition of uh, flying the coop, as it were, uh, at least for a few sessions here and there. Uh, of course, I myself would never dare think about something as debased and low-minded as not attending every single minute of annual conference. Uh, well, as far as clergy are concerned, the, the service of ordination is, in fact, part of, is the part of an annual conference where attendance is mandatory. So, uh, however tempting Hershey Park may seem on a particular day, uh, one must always be mindful of the ordination service. Uh, the Methodist Church, a denomination established as a church where God's word reigns supreme, not just in theory, but by the very vows which new ministers confess before the gathered assembly and most importantly before God. When candidates for ordination are presented, the presiding bishop asks them this question. Are you persuaded that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments contain all things necessary for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ and are the unique and authoritative standard for the church's faith and life? And the candidates respond by saying, I am so persuaded by God's grace. Uh, the bishop then follows with this question. Will you be faithful in prayer, in the study of Holy Scriptures, and with the help of the Holy Spirit continually rekindle the gift of God that is in you? The candidates respond, I will with the help of God. Now, if that wasn't enough, the, the bishop asks, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church, accepting and upholding its order, liturgy, doctrine, and discipline, defending it against all doctrines contrary to God's holy word? And again, they say, I will with the help of God. Now, of the, the five who received ordination this year, there was at least one person who I'm certain uh, did not believe the very words she had just confessed. Uh, as for the others, I simply did not know them on any level, theologically or personally. Uh, but you see, this is ordination in a church founded on and shaped by Holy Scripture. And so one, when one takes a holy vow in upholding biblical authority, any sort of, of conscious deception, it's, it's not merely just bearing false witness, it's a blatant disregard for the laws of the church and for the law of Holy Scripture. Now, for some, this may not seem too remarkable. Uh, after all, the, perhaps the most prominent United Methodist preacher of the past two decades, Adam Hamilton, you may have seen or taken one of his DVD Bible studies. Uh, one of the most influential United Methodist voices, Adam Hamilton, laid the foundation for biblical revisionism in his 2014 book called Making Sense of the Bible. Uh, one of the many uh, stunning conclusions offered to the church by Hamilton, is the contention that the inspiration of Holy Scripture is no different than all the other ways we claim to be inspired today, such as in writing a sermon or writing a poem or, or, or writing a song. Adam Hamilton argues that the Apostle Paul's inspiration in, in writing to his letters to the Corinthians is, quote, not qualitatively different from the way God inspires or influences today. In other words, we today possess the same inspiration that the writers of the New Testament experienced. Uh, the, the only difference, according to Hamilton, is that the inspired biblical writers were historically closer to the actual events themselves. Uh, well, let's see what our text says about this subject. Uh, John chapter 16 uh, and verse 12. These are the words of Jesus. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Here then, John 16 is Jesus' last evening with his apostles. It's the evening which he'll be arrested. And he tells them that he is leaving, and when he returns to the Father, he will send the person of the Holy Spirit who will guide them into all truth. Now, when reading these verses, John 16, 12 to 15, we need to be very clear who Jesus is speaking to. Uh, we may, must be careful not to insert ourselves too quickly into the action. 
the promises of Jesus in this passage are not direct promises to every Christian. Uh, they're not for us today. They're for his disciples, to these apostles. In verse 4 of this chapter, our Lord says to his disciples, But I have said these things to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. You may remember. Uh, and this is important because it's these disciples, these apostles, based on these promises, that will write the New Testament scriptures, which we read today. Uh, well, there are some clues telling us that Jesus is speaking to his disciples and not us. Um, a little bit back in, in chapter 14, Jesus promises that he would send the Holy Spirit who would remind the disciples of everything he had said to him. That's uh, John chapter 14, verse 26. Uh, basically, none of us were there. None of us can be reminded of Jesus' words in that way. You and I weren't there to be reminded. We're, we're far too young for that possibility. Uh, then in, in chapter 15, Jesus says that he's speaking to those who had been with him since the start of his public ministry. And that's uh, chapter 15, verse 27. You must also testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And so Jesus is talking to a, a unique group here. His chosen hand-picked followers and spokesmen, who with the Apostle Paul will later write the New Testament. Uh, the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus describes in these verses is not his work in us. It's his work in and through this unique group of apostles. Uh, however, where these verses do connect with us is in our response to what the apostles write. Verses 12 and 13. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. As we look at the unity of Christ's word and spirit, the first thing we notice is that for the apostles, for the writers of the New Testament, is that this spirit amplifies the truth of Jesus. The spirit amplifies the truth of Christ. Uh, a rather famous Methodist theologian called Thomas Oden, in his autobiography, A Change of Heart, he tells a story of how he spent the first 40 years of his life consumed with pursuing new ideas for the church, trying to formulate new doctrine and new beliefs for a rapidly changing Christian world. Then in the 1970s, at the age of 40, Oden changed his mind completely, whereby he spent the rest of his life preaching a return to Holy Scripture and biblical orthodoxy. Well, what changed his mind? What uh, caused him to uh, have this 180 degree turn? Along with conversations with a Jewish colleague at the university where he taught was a dream he had one night. He dreamt he was walking in the cemetery in New Haven when he accidentally stumbled upon his own gravestone. And on it, the epitaph read, Thomas Oden, he made no new contributions to theology. Suddenly, he said, he realized that was it. That was my life's work. I must make no new contributions. Likewise, we shouldn't expect new truths today. In fact, the apostles hadn't expected new truths. In John chapter 15, verse 15, Jesus tells them, I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. But you see, with his death and resurrection and ascension still ahead, uh, the disciples hadn't grasped it all. They, they haven't understood the implications that Jesus had told them, the significance of his death and resurrection, the, the implications for the whole world in the future to come. Jesus promises that through the guidance of his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, that the Holy Spirit would unpack all that he had said, all the truths that he had shared with them. In this way, Christ would direct the writers of the New Testament into all truth. But, well, the, this was a, a unique role that they had. There would be no need for any further revelation once the New Testament was written. Jesus promises, verse 13, that when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Now, there could be new ways to apply these truths. We, we face situations that the apostles couldn't possibly have imagined, but we don't need new truths for a new age. It's all here in Christ, unpacked for the apostles by the spirit of truth and written down definitively for us in the New Testament. The apostles themselves, they tell us, don't expect other apostles once we're gone. In fact, they warn against other so-called apostles. It's these inspired writings which will be the benchmark for all other truth claims. And so no church leader or, or council or synod or tradition or annual conference could claim to speak with any sort of infallibility. There's no secret truths for only a select few individuals. God's truth is revealed in Christ, communicated by Christ's spirit, unpacked for the disciples and written for the church. Uh, for that reason, then, the apostles are called, on more than one occasion in the, the New Testament, the apostles are called the foundation of the church. 
So for the writers of the New Testament, the Spirit amplifies the truth of Christ. And it means, of course, that we cannot separate what the apostles write from what Jesus says. They're one and the same. Jesus underlines it three times. Verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will speak on his own, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. Verse 14, he will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Verse 15, all that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, there are some who don't particularly care for what they read in the apostles' writings, whether it's issues of salvation or of judgment, of heaven and hell, human sexuality, our bodies, our identities, Christian ethics. So much of what we read in the New Testament goes against what the world thinks is just so obvious. Uh, my right to determine how I live, my choice uh, to what I identify as and what I do with my body. Some say, I, I don't like what the apostle Paul says, but I do love Jesus. And so they try to separate the teachings of the apostles from the teachings of Jesus. But John 16 won't let us do that. Uh, in fact, the only access we have to the teaching of Jesus are his word, words and the spirit-guided teachings of the apostles. Thomas Jefferson, that eccentric chief architect of the uh, Declaration of Independence, our third president, the political philosopher, the, uh, a deist, uh, a deist, one who believes that all religious truth should, should be subjected to the authority of human reason rather than divine revelation. As a deist, uh, he compiled what he called the uh, Jefferson Bible, or I guess what we call the Jefferson Bible. And in it, Jefferson attempted to reconstruct the Christian faith without any dogma or doctrine. He tried to uh, reconstruct a life of Jesus without any miracles. He claimed to have extracted, reduced, and cut down the gospel until the only, only thing left was, quote, the most sublime and benevolent code of morals that has ever been offered to man. It was an easy process, Jefferson said. He, he cut up the text verse by verse. He literally cut and pasted. Uh, and the good parts stuck out as, quote, diamonds in a dunghill. Uh, but once this, his version of the Bible, once this was stripped of every miracle and, and supernatural event, the Jefferson Bible doesn't even show Jesus to be a great moral teacher. It presents Jesus rather as someone who just didn't do anything. Uh, he, the blind don't see, the, uh, the lame don't walk, the multitudes remain hungry, even those seeking forgiveness are left wanting. Or perhaps you've seen one of these red letter Bibles. The, the words of Jesus are printed in red. Well, the truth is, of course, that the whole thing should be read in more ways than one. Uh, the words of the apostles inspired by the Holy Spirit are the words of Christ. And we're not free to pick and choose which bits of the Bible we want to emphasize or believe or obey. Uh, personally, I, I'm quite tired of hearing this played out argument that uh, Jesus himself didn't explicitly say this and that, therefore I think he would approve of this and that. That's called arguing, or arguing from silence. It's, I don't think I need to trot out examples to demonstrate this absurd logical fallacy. No, the, the writings of the apostles are the teachings of Christ unpacked by the Holy Spirit and written down for us. In, in other words, to reject the authority of the Old or New Testament, it's to reject the authority of Christ. Uh, the great J.I. Packer, he has this famous illustration of the Holy Spirit. I, I think that'll help us. Packer describes the Holy Spirit as being sort of this floodlight. Uh, when floodlighting is done well and when the fl floodlights are well placed, uh, you don't really notice them. You don't really see them. What you're meant to see is just the building on which the floodlights are, are trained on, which are directed upon. In the same way, Packer explains, in the same way as we read the writings of the apostles, the Holy Spirit is the hidden floodlight shining on the Savior, drawing our attention to him, to Christ. And this is what Jesus means in verse 14. The Spirit will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. As Jesus brought glory to the Father by revealing his character and doing his will, so the Spirit will bring glory to the Son by taking the things of Jesus and making them known to the apostles. And that's entirely right, verse 15. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I had said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so because God the Father has entrusted everything to the Son, the Holy Trinity, which we celebrate today, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit wants us to be a Jesus-centered people. Are we a church that has Christ at its center? Uh, put it to you this way. Are you looking for a church that is full of the Holy Spirit? Well, then find a church that makes Christ the center. You see, a church centered around the Holy Spirit to the neglect of Christ is likely to be a place that's only full of hot air. 
And yet it's possible for us to make the same mistake with the Bible. As Christians, we, we need to be aware of the equal but opposite danger. Of course, Holy Scripture must be the supreme authority in our church, but the book isn't an end in itself. The fifth chapter of John's gospel has Jesus telling a group of uh, Bible-centered people, if we could use that phrase, Jesus, Jesus observing them says this, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that testify on my behalf, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. The Bible is not some sort of masterpiece to be hung on the wall and admired. It's a window through which we see Christ. And so when we read our Bibles, who are we looking for? What questions do we ask? We need to ask, what does this tell me of Christ? Where is Christ? What does this say about following Jesus? Are these people following Jesus or are they examples of following themselves? The Holy Spirit's primary purpose as far as reading scripture is to shine a light on Jesus. So he should be my focus as I read his word. Uh, George Miller, a 19th century Christian evangelist and, and founder of a number of or orphanages near Bristol, England, he made a habit of reading the Bible daily and regularly. And he says this, the vigor of our spiritual life will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and our thoughts. I've read the Bible through a hundred times, he said, and always with increasing delight each time. It seems to me like a new book. And, and why is this? because it's the, the spirit of Christ speaking the word of Christ, which makes real to us the presence of Christ. Well, maybe you've had that experience as, as you read the Bible. I hope you have. An experience when we find the word of God coming with power and conviction. As we read the Sermon on the Mount, it's as though we're there on the hillside listening to Jesus preach. We feel that we're, we're there in the upper room as he breaks bread, that we're standing at the, the foot of the cross, and on Easter Sunday, we're there at the open grave. And when we read the apostles' letters, they may have been written to a particular church at a particular time, but they're written to us. We recognize them as the words of Christ today. No other book does that. As we read the, the words of Christ, the spirit of Christ shines his light into our hearts so that we see with the eyes of our hearts that there, that there in the scripture is exactly what we see. We see Christ, we hear Christ. This happens in the New Testament letter to the Galatians, where in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited as crucified. But that was 500 miles away and 20 years earlier. Paul is saying that through the Holy Spirit, who de delivered this message to them, they saw Christ crucified. And as we read the word of Christ, the spirit of Christ makes real to us the presence of Christ. We don't have to go all the way to Israel for these stories to come alive. Even if we could have sat with the disciples and listened to Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount, if we were there on the hillside listening from, from Christ's own mouth, it wouldn't make us more blessed than we are today, sitting with God's revealed word in our hands and the spirit of Christ in our hearts. This meeting Christ, it's not some mystical experience that we chase after. It's, it's there as we read, as we study, as we think, as we meditate on his word that he speaks to us today. Let me finish with a question if you're not a Christian believer. It's a question you may be asking. How could you know if the Bible is, is true? How could you know if the Bible is the word of God? Well, the word of God has always been under attack. We have an enemy who certainly doesn't want any of us to believe it. And there are so many lies about God's word that I think truly affect our relationship and our faith. But we'll never, ever be able to separate the truth of God from the lies of this world if we don't investigate the Bible ourselves. And so we must always approach Holy Scripture with the knowledge that the evil one constantly wants to cast doubt in our minds and confuse our thinking. So how can we know if the Bible is real? How do we know if it's true? Well, there's historical evidence. There are archaeological proofs. There's early manuscripts. There's the, the balance of historical prob probability, which is it's quite high. But historical evidence by itself will, will never convince anyone. It didn't convince those in the first century who actually saw Jesus. They didn't believe but if the Spirit of Christ speaking through the Word of Christ makes real to us the presence of Christ, then the one way to tell whether the Bible is true or not is to read it and ask God to show you. And, and how does God show you? Not, not through some mystical voice in the back of your head. The Spirit testifies through these words as we read them. 
If we want to know if the Bible is true, we read it and we ask God to help us understand it, help us to see what's in there. Again, the Bible's not a great masterpiece to be hung, at the, hung on the wall and admired. It's a window that when we open it up, we, we see breathtaking, magnificent views. Through the Spirit-inspired scriptures, we see and meet Christ, and that's how we know if his word is true. Well, if you are a Christian, if you confess that the Bible is the revealed word of God, that all of it, every jot and tittle, that all of it are, are the thoughts of God, if you believe that, that every word is the red-letter word of Christ, then I ask you these questions. Are you persuaded that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments contain all things necessary for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ and are the unique and authoritative standard for the church's faith and life? Will you be faithful in prayer, in the study of Holy Scripture, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, continually rekindle the gift of God that is in you? Will you defend your faith against all doctrines contrary to God's holy word? Let's pray together, and here's a great prayer of the psalmist, a wonderful prayer for us today and each day. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. For in Jesus' name we pray, amen. the time gone. They do say it flies when you're having fun. We end this evening with a rousing and inspirational hymn of thanksgiving. Clergyman Martin Rinkart wrote this enduring prayer nearly 400 years ago for his children, say, before bedtime. It's a wonderful expression of praise and gratitude. From the Royal Albert Hall, from all of us in Songs of Praise, thank you very much and goodbye. Mm -hmm.